Guess what? This is Law & Order SVU Season 3, Episode 6, Redemption. And this episode is a full feature film. We open up and we're in the courtroom and some lawyer is grilling Stabler. You testified under oath that you tested everyone who had personal contact with Leslie Bellow. Did you test her teacher? No. Her attorney? No. Her bus driver? The plumber who fixed the drain? No! Listen, douchebag, she didn't identify the fucking plumber as a rapist. Oh, <laughs> and eight-year-olds never lie. Kevin jumps up, rocking a dark brown pantsuit. Objection, this guy is a fuckhead. Withdrawn? Redirect, Your Honor. Detective Stabler, who did Leslie Bellow say was her rapist? He says, her grandfather. Thank you. Now it's little Leslie Bellow's turn to testify and she is nervous. Stabler says that he can't go in with her, but she's got this. She hands the teddy bear that she's hugging to Stabler and walks in. We jump ahead to the precinct later. Benza says, hey, how did it go? They let him walk. Damn. Well, juries screw up. Stabler explodes and sucker punches a whole bunch of coffee cups. Whole fucking system screwed up. Ooh, okay, so this one's gonna be about Stabes today. We jump forward and the team is getting filled in at a new site. The victim was 25-year-old Jennifer Walton. No signs of forced entry, but there is like a softball-sized hole in the door. Emmy Warner starts filling him in about the body. Hands were bound behind her back with pantyhose. Face pummeled, throat was slit, and she was raped. Too much blood to see if semen was present, but we'll test those sheets. Hey, look at this. Finn picks up a white rose laying next to the body. A romantic psycho. Stabler's in the corner. I thought my day couldn't get any worse. He's having a tough time. And you can tell that Benson really doesn't know how to take care of her grown ass baby man partner. So we're talking to the little old lady neighbor. She dogs at the victim's puppy about a month ago when she went away with some dude named David. Well, can you describe David? Yeah, he's tall, he's graying. She saw him outside of her apartment all the time bringing flowers. The neighbor gets upset and says, yeah, he was here last night yelling about how she ruined his life. I should have checked on her. Inside, Stabler is interviewing the friend that found her and he's being a real dick about it. You heard a guy's voice on the phone? What did it sound like? Okay, well, how did she sound? Nervous, upset? I'm not sure. Is there anything you're sure about? Jesus. Elliot, Benson calls him over. Calm your shit and check this out. There's some wine and a wine glass. This one has lipstick on it. There's another one in the kitchen that's been scrubbed clean. Oh, also, there's a knife in the kitchen that's been scrubbed clean too. Well, there goes that evidence, but look, we've got some blood on the sofa. The spatter says that she was hit first on the sofa and then dragged. Then her clothes are neatly folded, even though the buttons were ripped off. Emmy Warner says, hey, guess what? You're looking for a lefty. He cut this way across her neck and left blood spatter on this wall. Benson says, okay, so then he head to the bathroom and showered, washes the glass and the knife, and takes the towels with him. Well, you got it all figured out. Well, at least I'm trying. We're back at the precinct and everybody thinks this is a crime of passion. But wait a second, he had the wherewithal to clean up after himself? And Huang thinks that maybe it's because the violence is what's actually soothing to him. The initial outburst sends a flood of serotonin to his brain, which calms him while he works through his anger. So it looks like we're looking for somebody who wooed her first. And he leads on that boyfriend stabler, but stabler's not there. He's turned around and walked away. Okay. Munch and Finn are talking with Emmy Warner in the morgue. He could have cut his hand on her broken tooth. Let's canvas the ER for hand injuries. And here's something weird. Pulls down the sheet and there's two missing circles of skin. It looks like two pieces of salami. Girl, why didn't you lead with that? That is weird as fuck. So we go to the clothing store where Jenny the victim worked and we find that a David Stedman works there. Jenny's coworker is spilling the tea. He's married, not like that ever stopped him. He's the manager in women's shoes. Last year, Tammy and Cosmetics had to file a lawsuit because he wouldn't leave her alone. We go up the escalator and to the right, and there's David Stedman, selling a pair of shoes by literally rubbing a woman's leg. So we bring David Stedman in and what's this? His hand is wrapped. Oh, Stabler's in his face. What did you do with Jennifer? We know you were at her apartment. We saw the door. Is that what this is about? I'll pay for the damn door. You murdered her. Wait, what the f She's dead? Stabler grabs him out of the chair and slams him against the wall. Benson's like, Elliot, calm. But he's not listening to Benson. Tell me what happened. She threw me out at seven, I swear. Aw, that lady put you there at 8.30, bitch. No, you can check the hospital. Check the hospital? Yep. He signed in at 7.52. 
damn. But as Benson and Stabler are leaving, boom, in through the door they wheel another victim. She's had her throat slit, take her to three. Second victim's name is Celia Mitchell. That's a great name. She's 25, teaches as an elementary aide. Landlord found her tucked in her bed and with her throat slit, just like the first victim. Perp took a shower, left a white rose. We've obviously seen all this before. The two victims are super similar. Young, blonde, work with kids. Huang says though, they never quite meet his romantic expectation, but he catered his approach. Wine for Jenny, chocolates for Celia. If he came at me with cheese, I'd be victim number three. So that means he probably knew them. Huang thinks he's white, educated, probably middle management. Stabler's like, I'm in dickhead mode. Why didn't you pick up on this earlier, Huang? Because the pattern didn't emerge until the second victim did. This guy might have been doing this for like 10 or 15 years. You're gonna have to go back a hell of a lot longer than that. Everybody turns around and there's Detective Hawkins. Who the fuck is this? Chin in a suit. He's an old drunk detective that Stabler's gonna be buds with. This guy looks like if Ben Affleck was Botoxed into looking like Matt Damon. So Stabler and Hawkins are in talking with Cragen. Hawkins says, do you remember the Soho Strangler? Yeah, he would rape and strangle victims. You put him away. Yeah, well, he's out. Six months ago, went on parole. Yeah, well, our guy doesn't squeeze throats. He cuts them. Does he tuck them into bed? Does he leave a white rose? Well, it could be a copycat. I doubt it. We never released that information. But the Soho Strangler was a biter. So is this guy. Now he cuts his bite marks out. So the guy that confessed to being the Soho Strangler, his name was Roger Barry. And obviously, Hawkins has a lot of experience with Roger Barry. So Hawkins has been temporarily reassigned to the SVU. Goody. When Olivia gets to forensics, they basically tell her it's the second verse, same as the first. They found zero evidence on anything, except one little contact lens. And this guy had shit eyes. Hawkins and Stabler are a man walking up to Roger's apartment. They knock once, and when he doesn't open the door immediately, Hawkins roundhouse kicks that motherfucker open. <laughs> Stabler's trying to play it cool. I don't see a warrant around here. Uh, are you sure this is our guy's apartment? Hawkins is like, ha ha, look at this. Newspaper clippings of our two victims. Roger's PO shows up and says, yeah, he wasn't even at work today. So he's probably at his mom's. Our two manly men head out to Roger's mom's house to harass her. She's like a hundred thousand years old and she's gardening in a bucket hat. She looks up and sees Hawkins coming down the drive and she says, you, your boy is at it again. He's done nothing wrong. Ah, well, he actually confessed. You tricked him. If I find out that you're hiding him again, I'm gonna have you for accessory. She takes a hit of her oxygen. Go to hell! Slams the door. Stabler is just kind of watching this like, and I thought I was unhinged. Look, you're working my case. From now on, we do things my way. This doesn't phase Hawkins in the least bit. I'm hungry and I need more alcohol. They sit down at the bar in this greasy spoon joint. Hawkins orders a couple of big ass burgers and a double bourbon, neat. Stabler orders a beer and does not specify what kind. They try and have a back and forth and there's just too much ego. That was a hard one to lose today. I'm just so sick of losing. What are you gonna do? Quit? No. All that's required for evil to triumph is for a few good men to do nothing. Here's to a few good men. Stabler gets a phone call. It's Munch, and guess what? Roger does flower deliveries and did a flower delivery to one of the victims before she was murdered. The bartender comes up and sets down a big old burger. Hey, your boy is late. Sometimes Roger will watch the boats on Pier 41. Hawkins says, Damn. Then he takes one enormous bite out of his hamburger, throws it down, and runs out. <laughs> they head to the pier, and there's Roger, standing on the edge with a noose around his neck. This guy's gonna jump. I won't go back there. Stabler tackles him before he goes over the edge. So now Stabler and Hawkins are interrogating this Roger Berry guy. He doesn't know either of the victims. The reason he had those clippings was because his mom sent them to him and said, they're gonna try and take you in for this. And then in a real deja vu moment, Hawkins grabs this guy and throws him against the wall. He's bawling. I want my mom. Your mama can't help you. Now Stabler's the one that's trying to get him to calm down. Jump ahead and we're all in Craigan's office. Hawkins is sitting there. The fuck do you mean cut him loose? Benson says, we don't have the DNA back yet. We have nothing to hold him. This is Roger's signature. Uh, correction, it's the killer's 
signature. Turns out this guy Roger is like cognitively impaired. Put me in there for five minutes, Cragen, and I'll have him singing a different tune. Oh, cute. Police brutality. Well, he's lawyered up, so fuck off. Hawkins storms out and we're all starting to realize Roger's not the Soho Strangler, is he? Well, go check the files again. But when they get there to grab the files, they've already been checked out by none other than Detective John Hawkins. Son of a bitch. Stabler's like, uh, we have dicks in common. I'll handle it. Stabler heads over to Hawkins' house to find him totally wasted, smoking a cigarette, and listening to those old interrogation tapes. Just based on like the 30 seconds that we listen to, yeah, it's total coercion. I took 18 years from that man and God knows how many women have died. You can't make something like that up. Stabler says, so what are you gonna do? Quit? See what I did there? Because that's what you said to me earlier. So they sit down and review the files together. And what's this? They find that one of the victims had an appointment in her date book for somebody named A.B. A.B., Arthur Blessard, was the guy who ID'd Roger in the first place. Back at the precinct, they're running all the murders that have similar M.O. all across the country. And weird, they match up with where Blessard was living. Now, this guy's working for the IRS. Let's go pick this motherfucker up. And he's not at work, but they find files for both Jennifer and Celia. He was using their taxes to stalk them. His date book is here. Beverly Parsons, a Appointment at 5 p.m. today. <gasps> it's 4.45. They fly over there. They hear glass break when they're walking up, so you know they're kicking that door down. He's in helping clean up a broken wine glass, and uh, he's brought flowers. You're under arrest, douchebag. They bring Arthur in, and he thinks he is smart as fuck. But careful, you've got the two most fragile cops in New York circling you like a shark. He totally lawyers up, but from the search warrant of his apartment, they know for sure that he was setting Roger up. So here's the problem. We don't have enough evidence. He can argue that he was a welcome guest. And we have to be careful because of the history of this case. <laughs> Roger Barry. <clears throat> but wait. Artie didn't used to be so neat and tidy. In fact, in one of the earliest crimes, he left a semen stain. There were two sets of DNA, so to isolate his, we need the DNA of that victim. Problem is, she's been dead and buried for 18 years. Time to dig her up. We gotta convince the parents. All right, let's exhume her. Boom, DNA matches. Let's go collect this motherfucker. Stabler and Botox face show up at this guy's apartment. The door's locked, and this time, they hold hands and both kick the door in. Guns drawn, they're walking through the house. Nobody's in there. But Hawkins looks out the window. <gasps> Artie's escaping. He heads out after him on the fire escape ladder and just doesn't tell Stabler that he's going. So then we get like a seven minute montage where Hawkins is chasing the perp and then Stabler is chasing Hawkins, parkouring over the rooftops. Finally, when Stabler catches up, Artie is hanging off the side of the building. Hawkins is casually standing up over him. Hawk, don't do this. Don't do what, partner? We both know the system sucks. If you do this, you're no better than he is. He's an evil man, Elliot. All it takes for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Hawkins nods. You're gonna make an old drunk do this by himself or are you gonna come over here and help me? <laughs> they both grab Blessard by like his shirt and pull him back up over the side of the building. Your collar, Hawk. Fade to black, Dick Wolf. Somebody was super proud of this one and that was Law & Order SVU Season 3, Episode 6. Jum jum. <laughs>